Welcome back to the College of Glycation. In this episode, we're diving into a powerful and increasingly urgent topic, the link between glycation and mental health. I'm your host, Paul Reynolds. I'm a biomedical scientist and professor of cell biology. We're stepping in today into the rapidly expanding field of metabolic psychiatry, and I believe glycation may be a missing yet critical piece of the puzzle. While we've laid the foundation of what glycation is in earlier episodes in this College of Glycation, today we'll revisit the basics first, just briefly, before exploring how glycation impacts the brain, fueling neuroinflammation, impairing neurotransmitter systems, and tangling itself with insulin resistance. We'll also explore how diet and gut health modulate this complex web, and finally, how we can protect our minds through practical, evidence-based strategies. So if you're someone who's ever felt like there was more to mental health than simply serotonin or therapy, this episode is for you. So let's get into it. To understand glycation's potential role in mental health, we have to quickly revisit what glycation actually is. Glycation is a non-enzymatic reaction where sugar molecules, or more accurately, their reactive byproducts, that could include methylglyoxal and others, bind to proteins, lipids, and even DNA. These reactions lead to the formation of what are known as advanced glycation end products, or AGEs. Once formed, these ages are largely irreversible. They accumulate, especially in people with chronically elevated blood sugar, or those that experience excessive oxidative stress. And these ages damage tissue by stiffening proteins, promoting inflammation, and generating reactive oxygen species. Ages can form inside our bodies or endogenously, or they could come from the food that we eat from the outside, that's exogenous. Foods that are highly or overgrilled, fried, and even roasted too far, are or are processed at high temperatures, are especially rich in ages. Once consumed, a portion of these ages enters into our circulation and can deposit in tissues, contributing to overall glycation burden. While the damaging effects of ages on our blood vessels, our kidneys, eyes, and skin are well documented, their impact on the brain is less well understood. But mounting evidence suggests it is still significant. Ages trigger inflammation through a receptor called RAGE, or the receptor for advanced glycation end products and RAGE is a protein found on key brain cells. These cells include microglia, which are the resident macrophages in charge of cleaning up the area, astrocytes, which are the most numerous glial cell type that helps maintain the architecture of the brain, and even endothelial cells. Those are the ones that line blood vessels critical in nourishing brain tissue. But don't forget about the neurons, those two, the most important functional molecule-based cells, are also prone to glycation. When ages activate rage, they set off a molecular cascade that includes the activation of a very important inflammatory switch, and that switch is called NF-kappa B. When NF-kappa B is activated, it leads to the release of inflammatory cytokines. These could include IL-1-beta, TNF-alpha, and IL-6. These inflammatory molecules, or cytokines, play a powerful role in brain function, but also brain dysfunction. When microglia, again, the brain's resident immune cells, are activated chronically, they adopt a more pro-inflammatory state and this can impair synaptic plasticity, reduce neurogenesis, and even kill off neurons in vulnerable regions such as the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, 
Those are regions deeply involved in the regulation of your mood and in executive function. Inflammation doesn't stop at killing neurons. It also disrupts the release of neurotransmitters as well as the synthesis of those neurotransmitters. And therefore, neurotransmitter signaling suffers. For example, inflammation diverts tryptophan, a precursor to serotonin, down a pathway leading to the production of neurotoxic metabolites. Neurotoxic metabolites in this case could include quinolinic acid and others. This process depletes serotonin and generates exocytotoxic byproducts that further harm brain tissue. The net result is a disrupted balance between neurotransmitters, lowered serotonin and dopamine, altered glutamate signaling, all of which are implicated in depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. Ages don't just provoke inflammation, they also directly impair cellular machinery. They damage mitochondrial enzymes, for instance, distort neuronal membrane function, and also stiffen the matrix that's on the outside of all of these brain cells. That includes the matrix around important nourishing blood vessels. Now this vascular stiffening is important because it can restrict nutrient flow to neurons and impede the brain's lymphatic system its waste clearance pathway. Over time, this creates a slow suffocation, if you will, of neural tissue. Researchers studying neurodegenerative conditions like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and ALS have already implicated ages in the cross-linking and aggregation of misfolded proteins. While we're only beginning to explore the parallels in psychiatric illness, the mechanisms of injury are strikingly similar. Inflammation, oxidative stress, and impaired cellular signaling. Running parallel to glycation is the issue of insulin resistance, a core concern in metabolic psychiatry. Insulin does far more than regulate blood sugar. In the brain, insulin facilitates glucose uptake in neurons and also glial cells. It modulates synaptic plasticity and influences mitochondrial function. All of this under the umbrella of supportive growth factor signaling. When insulin signaling falters, the brain begins to starve, not only from a lack of glucose, but from an inability to use it effectively. Studies have repeatedly shown that people with major depressive disorder have higher rates of insulin resistance. For instance, a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry showed a clear association between insulin resistance and both the prevalence and severity of depression. Meta-analyses confirm that insulin resistance is more pronounced during acute depressive episodes. Inflammatory cytokines that we talked about previously, many of them downstream of glycation, can also interfere with insulin signaling at the level of its receptor, specifically through serine phosphorylation of the insulin receptor substrate. If this occurs, it will disrupt the PI3K or AKT pathway, leading to impaired cellular energy use and mitochondrial problems. Insulin resistance doesn't just contribute to depression, however. It's also linked to anxiety and bipolar disorder, particularly to more severe and treatment-resistant forms. Inflammation and oxidative stress compromise insulin signaling and in turn, impaired insulin signaling perpetuates an inflammatory state. Glycation sits squarely in this loop 
adding fuel to this metabolic fire. To understand how glycation connects to the broader landscape of mental health, we must also consider the gut-brain axis, or the relationship between our digestive system and the brain. The foods we eat don't just affect blood sugar. They shape our microbiome, that is the good and the bad bacteria found within our bodies. And when they shape our microbiome, they influence systemic inflammation, glycation, and ultimately brain function. A Western-style diet, one that is rich in sugars, highly processed grains, and fried foods, is a direct source of exogenous ages and glycation precursors. In fact, several studies have shown correlations between high dietary age intake and poorer cognitive performance, higher depressive symptoms, and even greater anxiety. Though causation is still being worked out, the associations are compelling. The gut microbiome also metabolizes some of the glycation intermediates. A diverse, fiber-rich diet appears to help the gut buffer your glycation burden, while dysbiosis, that's where you have disrupted microbiome, too many of the bad bacteria and not enough of the good bacteria can also exacerbate or worsen your glycation burden. An unhealthy gut produces inflammatory compounds such as lipopolysaccharide, which can leak into circulation and stimulate systemic inflammation. This further activates our microglial cells, the brain's immune system, impairs insulin signaling, and drives your glycation upward. Emerging research suggests that the microbiome may even play a role in modulating age absorption but also degradation. A robust, balanced gut ecosystem could therefore potentially mitigate glycation's impact, while a weakened one will simply amplify it. In psychiatric research, interventions like probiotic supplementation and high-fiber diets have shown small but measurable improvements in mood, effects that may be partially explained by reduced inflammation and improved insulin sensitivity. So how do we bring all these threads together? Well, here is a tentative, evidence-based model for how glycation might contribute to mental health pathology. A diet high in sugars and ultra-processed foods drives internal glycation and delivers large amounts of ages directly into the bloodstream. At the same time, that diet damages the gut microbiome and increases intestinal permeability, allowing inflammatory molecules to spill into circulation. This inflammation, therefore, will disrupt insulin signaling, fuels oxidative stress, and opens the door to glycation's more destructive downstream effects. Once ages accumulate, they then activate rage receptors throughout the brain, and this sparks microglial activation, cytokine release, mitochondrial dysfunction, and the derailment of serotonin, dopamine, and glutamate signaling. Brain regions responsible for emotional regulation, like the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus, therefore become impaired. Energy production falters, synapses atrophy, and neuroplasticity is blunted. For someone with a genetic or psychological predisposition to mood disorders, this creates a perfect storm. Metabolic dysfunction, neuroinflammation, and neurotransmitter chaos. Glycation doesn't need to be the sole cause, but it may be the accelerant that takes a smoldering predisposition and turns it into a wildfire. So what can we do to mitigate this? Well, while there are no magic bullets, there is power in stacking small evidence-based strategies to lower glycation, improve insulin sensitivity, and reduce 
inflammation. Choosing foods that create minimal glycation burden is a powerful start. That means reducing the intake of highly processed and overbrowned foods, cooking with moist heat instead of dry high heat, and avoiding sugars that spike blood glucose. Marinating foods in acetic, um, acidic rather, and oxidant-rich bases can also reduce age formation during cooking including antioxidant-rich vegetables and spices like turmeric and berries may add further protection. Physical activity has been talked about a lot in this podcast and it is known to improve insulin sensitivity. And if you're sensitive to insulin, you will better manage sugar, which is the fuel for glycation. Even simple changes like walking after meals can reduce the glycemic impact of a carbohydrate-heavy meal, thereby lowering the potential for glycation. You may consider time-restricted eating or what some call intermittent fasting because it can also help by reducing overall glycemic load and improving your sensitivity to insulin. And of course, sleep, stress reduction, circadian alignment all play foundational roles in buffering the body against excess inflammation. Remember, as we talked about today, even though we're focused on the brain, gut health cannot be overlooked. Consuming prebiotic fibers from vegetables, legumes, and those types of of, uh, food sources can feed beneficial bacteria that help regulate inflammation and possibly even metabolize glycation intermediates. Let's consider again, fermented foods like kefir, sauerkraut, or yogurt, particular types, that may restore microbial diversity and support your gut-brain axis in regulating your mood. Even micronutrients may help. Deficiencies in magnesium, zinc or vitamin D can increase oxidative stress and impair your insulin sensitivity and therefore tipping the balance toward glycation. So support the body's antioxidant defense systems through proper nutrition and lifestyle is one more way to keep the system in balance. So in research settings, compounds like carnosine, Um, uh, peroxidamine and others have been explored for their anti-glycation properties, though I think we're still far from having clinical protocols. But these types of studies do point to a future where psychiatric care may include appropriately metabolic profiling and glycation-lowering therapies. Glycation, I promise, is not a fringe concept. It is a fundamental chemical process with implications that extend far beyond diabetes or aging skin. It may be a hidden amplifier of mental illness, fueling inflammation, transmitter dysfunction, and impaired energy metabolism in the brain. While we need longitudinal studies, brain imaging, and intervention trials to fully map the role of glycation in psychiatry, the mechanistic plausibility discussed here remains compelling. Metabolic psychiatry is offering us a new framework and glycation may be one of its key levers. Thanks one and all for listening today to the College of Glycation. Stay curious and stay metabolically aware. By understanding how ages cross-link proteins, induce insulin resistance, and block repair, we can gain more insight into improving our metabolic health. Until next time, may your brain be clear, your cells be clean, and your mitochondria mighty.